Tri-Cities Community Television presents the fourth speaker series, Live Stories, put on by the Coquitlam Public Library. All right, we acknowledge the Coquitlam Public Pro Library provides service on the unceded traditional territory of the Coquitlam First Nation, which lies within the shared territories of the Tsleil-Waututh, Katsi, Musqueam, Kakite, Squamish and Stolo Nations. Welcome to our fourth and second last session in our five-part speaker series, Life Stories. We wanted to present real life stories of people from marginalized groups and how they experience prejudice, social inclusion, or st exclusion, sorry, or stigma. By understanding and appreciating everyone's past and present, we can build a better future for all. We want to thank you for coming to this session. Please join us for the last session next Tuesday evening, November 22nd, when our session is about recent immigrants. For more information about the next session, please check out our website at www.coqlibrary.ca. <laughs> Tonight we continue our series with focus on Indigenous people. Now we do have two speakers who are supposed to come, and one is here, um, and hopefully uh, Elder Maria Reed will join us soon. So we will welcome questions at the end of the presentation, and I'd like to welcome up Karen LaFontaine. Um, I'll let Karen introduce herself, and um, welcome, Karen. Thank you. Do you want me to do the mic? Do I have to stand? You don't have to stand. You oh, can do okay. whatever you want. Okay, well, I'll stand for a while. I might sit down after. I don't think I need a mic. I have okay. a pretty loud, deep male voice. <laughs> 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 Sounds like a male, but I'm female. Uh, so good evening. Um, nice to see you all. Typically when we're gathering, I would do a round of introductions and have everyone introduce yourself, uh, where you're from, where your family's from. That's our way of kind of getting to know each other. But because we're being recorded, uh, we won't do that tonight for your own uh, privacy. Um, but that's how we know where people are from and that's how we build relationships within our communities as well. So thank you for coming tonight. Again, we're on the unceded traditional territory of the Tsleil-Waututh First Nation, Musqueam First Nation, Coquitlam First Nation people here uh, through this territory, Port Coquitlam and Coquitlam. And when we say unceded, what we mean by that, for those of who don't know, um, means that the land has never been relinquished uh, to the Crown or to the government. It's actually held, so they say, in trust for Indigenous people. Um, so still the stewards of the land, uh, still the original peoples of this territory and all across uh, this area of what my nation and we call uh, Turtle Island um, along the Coast Salish territories here as well. So my English name is Karen LaFontaine. Um, my family, my ancestry is from Wood Mountain, uh, Saskatchewan, Lakota First Nation through my maternal uh, lineage. Um, and so that's in Treaty 1 territory of Saskatchewan. Uh, my ancestors before that came from Montana and South Dakota area through the Lakota uh, traveling of no borders up into Saskatchewan during the Indian Wars. Um, through my uh, maternal lineage on my grandfather's side, I'm also Métis. Uh, from what's now called St. Xavier, St. Francis Xavier uh, Métis Settlement in Manitoba, and that was one of the first original Métis settlements that was there. Um, previously, the name of that Métis settlement was uh, White Long Plain, and also known as Grantstown, um, and Grantstown was actually my ancestor, Cuthbert Grant, who was one of the first uh, families of settlers in that territory. And through my paternal lineage, I am Scottish ancestry. Uh, my father was first generation born here in Canada. Um, through that part of my family, uh, my grandfather came over when he was 12 or 13 years old on the merchant marine ships. And uh, after settling in the Okanagan, he uh, ended up marrying my grandmother. So my father was one of their uh, first born and only child. So he was a first generation born here in Canada through my maternal or my paternal lineage. So my maternal lineage uh, has been through these territories since time memorial. And my paternal lineage was first, first generation here. So I have a lot of different uh, background that way, although I don't really have a huge connection to my Scottish ancestry for lots of reasons. I didn't grow up really with my father, so I grew up more with my First Nations culture and uh, was raised that way through that. And so um, 
I am uh, talking tonight just a little bit about uh, my role um, that I'm currently in and I work for Ministry of Children and Family Development uh, in New Westminster um, through what's called the North Fraser Service Delivery Area and I'm one of five uh, Indigenous Roots workers that work throughout the offices here um, in North Fraser. Um, throughout BC I think now there's probably maybe 20 uh, Indigenous Roots workers that work within the ministry offices. And so our roles um, are very specific and unique in that um, we are within ministry offices working with children and youth that are uh, temporary in care and I always like to say temporary because we never want children to remain in ministry care. Um, the idea is that it's always temporary and I also work uh, with families who are caring for Indigenous children who are extended family who may not necessarily be Indigenous on that side of the family. So, um, Whoa, that's loud. Okay. So um, our roles as roots workers within the ministry, we were hired um, specifically to work with Indigenous children and youth in care. But a lot of our role also involves uh, supporting um, to MCFD staff and outside service providers through uh, child and youth supported needs, through uh, child and youth mental health, through early uh, childhood learning. So most of my role um, on top of the roots work that we do has also been forms of education and sharing sessions such as this uh, throughout different service levels of the ministry throughout, actually throughout the Lower Mainland, not just specifically for North Fraser. Um, so we also uh, work collaboratively with social workers, uh, attending family group conferences, attending mediation. Um, probably the biggest part of our role is searching for community, um, connecting with communities for Indigenous children and youth in care, um, looking up family ancestry, uh, applying for First Nations status, applying for Métis citizenship for children and youth. Um, out of the population across Canada, which is right now, uh, as of yesterday or the day before, 1.8 million people in North America in this area of Canada that are Indigenous. Uh, so out of that 1.8 million in BC, 10% uh, of children and youth population here in this area um, of Indigenous children and youth, it's 68% as of a few weeks ago that are in care, in ministry care, right? So even though Indigenous children and youth only make up 10% of the population, there's 68% that are currently in care, which has, you know, tells us a lot, right? So the over-representation uh, of Indigenous children and youth in care. Um, the majority population is, uh, when we look at, um, territories uh, and nations itself, um, right now currently the highest population is Métis children. So across Canada they make up about 71% of Indigenous children in care and then the other percentage are uh, First Nations and uh, Inuit. So Métis, um, you know, uh, population is large. It's one of the largest Indigenous populations across Canada to begin with um, and one of the largest populations of children, youth, and care. Um, so lots of changes, of course, going on with Métis Nation and Métis Commission for uh, through the federal legislation that's been happening over the past couple of months uh, in the past year um, regarding child welfare and Indigenous communities and voices in having the rights uh, of, their, of their children um, be adhered to by their direction instead of by the government's direction. So, so as Roots Workers, um, establishing connections to community, establishing connections to family. A lot of children and youth that we work with and their parents and grandparents, aunties and uncles, uh, many times do not have a connection to their culture, do not have a connection to their community or their ancestry um, due to displacement. Uh, when we look at, you know, residential school, we look at the 60s scoop where children, you know, were displaced from their families. Uh, a lot of times, you know, moved from different communities into different provinces even. Um, and so that connection uh, not always is, has been established. So our role is to really search out and try and identify um, the territory of origin for those families, where their families originally came from. And it's a lot of research, it's a lot of detective work. Um, 
and it's a lot of uh, kind of uh, building relationships with families and trying to obtain information from them to uh, try and search that origin of ancestry within their family lineage and that's a that's a big part of our work as well um, another big piece of work is uh, connecting with foster parents who are caring for indigenous children and youth in their homes uh, and over the past couple of years, part of our reconciliation plan has really changed as far as embedding um, culture in those homes. Uh, previously, in past years, um, putting on different things, putting on different sessions, cultural events, we found it was really difficult for foster parents to attend those things in communities that we put on because of their own schedules, because of those children or youth schedule, school, different events, different things they were involved in. So what we started doing was thinking of ways that we could actually connect those children and youth to their culture that would be easy, accessible and actually attainable, not just for the children and youth, but for the foster parents as well. Um, so what we started doing was uh, having elders go into the homes of those uh, foster parents and caregivers and taking information and cultural materials and having uh, conversations and dialogue to support that foster parent and that child and youth with the idea that, you know, conversations start uh, with within that home, within the walls of that home, about the child's identity, about the child's community, sense of belonging, um, their background, who their people are. Um, and really enforcing positive role models for children and youth. Um, and that's really been our goal over the past three years, uh, is to really instill that and, and provide foster parents with that support as well, um, so that they feel safe to ask questions, they feel uh, supported that they can uh, get additional information. And we're taking in uh, cultural materials that are specific and unique to that child's actual Indigenous identity. Um, we also uh, support with um, providing cultural safety plans, which are done up usually every six months to a year. And the nation, uh, the uh, territory and nation that the child is from, where their ancestral lineage is from, is contacted and their input, either through elders or through cultural safety workers, is part of that as well. Um, so their input is put into there into that document with the idea that that document is a living document and it's age appropriate for children and youth um, and it's attainable, the recommendations that we put in it. And so we always start with the most important things for our children and our youth that uh, we feel their ancestors would want to know and want those children to know um, and that always starts with language, right? because our language is so important and it's important for children and youth to learn their language. Even if they learn one word at a time, how to say hello, uh, how to pronounce their, their nation in their language or their territory name, that's all important. And so we usually start from that. Um, and also their origin stories. What are their oral history stories from their territories and their tribe or their nation? That's another most important thing is that oral history that's handed down so that they have some of those stories that they can remember, that they can talk about, that they can relate to as children and youth as well. Um, in urban settings uh, like we live in here, um, I think 70, I think it's 71 percent of Indigenous children and youth that live off reserve actually live in urban settings such as this. Um, and a lot of times it's really trying to find ways that we could connect uh, children and youth to their identity. And if we're living in communities, in our own communities, one of the ways, of course, is we're living, we're already living on the land, right? We're already living on our territories. And so we have communities. We have elders that are part of that. We have people that can support us with our teachings and our traditions and our learnings. We have aunties, we have uncles. We have beyond the nuclear family that most people think about, right? And not necessarily blood relatives. We have people that are a family that aren't blood relation. And so those teachings, and those understandings of our medicines, of our songs, of our territory, of the history of that territory, we learn when we're in our community. But for children and youth who are living in urban settings where we're surrounded here by concrete uh, and we're surrounded by so much busyness, a lot of times they can't find that grounding and that understanding of that. So how we start with connecting them is taking them out onto the land here as best as we can in whatever way we can, so towards the water 
right? We take them towards the water, on the water. We take them canoeing. Um, we get them connected to medicines, even here teaching them. What are the traditional plants and medicines here on these territories? Um, what can you do with them here? Right? Traditional foods. So we start teaching them how to cook traditional foods specific to their nation, to their territory. How to cook deer, how to cook rabbit. Um, you know, how to uh, make different stews, how to make different uh, seafoods, where does it come from? And that understanding of that connection of that animal uh, to that land, to them as a, as a child or a youth within that circle. Um, and how in that circle they're connected to everything. Um, and to try and teach them the basis of that while they're living here in these territories. So for a lot of families, um, even supporting parents and grandparents who have been, you know, disconnected from their communities and their families here uh, within this territory. We usually, everything we do is to try and include uh, the extended family as well, whether it's parents or grandparents caring for the child, because the child's always in the center and everyone that's part of that child's life needs that support and needs to have that connection as well to anything that we're sharing and teaching them as well. And so the cultural piece is so important and um, as we know the history uh, with residential school and the effects that that have caused generationally through all of our people uh, in one way or another and it might not be directly to that child or youth that you see in front of you but you can guarantee somewhere in that child or youth extended family it has affected through generational trauma, through genocide, loss of culture, loss of language. Um, and we really try to focus uh, with youth and children on the positive of our people, the positive role models, not the stereotypes, not the biasms uh, that a lot of people carry because of uneducation, right? Because a lot of generations of non-Indigenous people have carried biasms and stereotypes that have been handed down to them through their own homes, through their own generations of untruths. So in my heart, I always like to believe and I always try and share with people that it's, uh, I really would truly believe that people aren't born that way, that they're not generally like racist that way and stereotypical that way and that it's just been learned behavior. And so how do we change that learned behavior is by education, right? And to instill that positiveness um, and to focus on, especially with children and youth, the positive role models within our communities. When we look at the health, you know, and sciences, and we look at the education system, uh, we look at, you know, all the different uh, aspects of learning throughout generations that Indigenous people have contributed to, right? When we look at uh, National Indigenous Day, when we look at, you know, National uh, Indigenous Veterans Day, 100 and 121,000 Indigenous men and women went to war for this country as code talkers, right? People fighting for this country that, you know, they weren't even recognized. Uh, and when they came back, like many vets, they weren't recognized, you know, not supported. And, and these are people, these are men and women who lost their rights, lost their land, their title, their status, uh, and went and still fought for this country. Right? So we have to respect and honor that. But we have to really focus on, on that positive uh, resiliency with children and youth too. Um, and a lot of youth you know, that I work with over the past couple of years is really focusing on people that are even from their own communities, that are great leaders, that have provided great leadership within their nations, within their own communities as well. Um, not just throughout this country, but right in their own community and circle as well, and trying to really focus on that. Um, so as Roots Workers, we, we do a lot of educational pieces, and we also um, really try to support uh, everyone that's connected to that child or youth, whether it's a caregiver, uh, whether it's extended family, uh, member. I think in the North Fraser offices that I work in, we have the lowest uh, number of children and youth in care out of all of BC, um, which is, you know, that's, that's good. The idea is, of course, at the end that we all work ourselves out of a job, mm -hmm. right? And so that we don't have any Indigenous children and youth in care. Um, but we have, we do have the lowest numbers of children and youth that are in care in North Fraser. So um, something that we're doing is, is really uh, 
working in a better way and it is through you know thinking outside of the box and really supporting uh, in a way that children can remain with their families extended families in their communities and really to look at reunification in a way that um, that goes beyond uh, the roles that we have and it goes to higher levels of policy and practice and so what can we do to change that and what we can do uh, what can we do to change policy from higher levels as well so that there is more support um, when we look at the territory that we live in here which is the most expensive you know one of the most expensive places to live uh, across this country where housing is just limited you know to to the to the extreme where you know families can't even find somewhere to live um, so how do we support that how do we support children and youth staying with their families when we live in such a place where people can't find housing you know where there's waiting lists for months and months and months so it's looking at thinking outside of the box and how can we support in a better way so that children stay with their families um, when we work with children who uh, have been in care um, and the re reunification with the parent uh, has been extended and it's looking like it's not going to be able to happen um, what we look at doing then is to uh, explore extended family members as well so that's part of our role as roots workers as well so checking uh, layers and layers of family uh, not just for permanency planning, not just for caregiving, but for also connections to that child or youth. Um, because a lot of families can't care for, for their children or take that on at that time. But it's still positive to have a connection to family members who are healthy, right? And I was always told, you know, through my life, you should always have someone within arm's length in your family that's healthy that you can go to, no matter what. And so for children and youth, it's really important that, that there is someone within arm's length that can connect to them and support them, uh, especially when they go into their teen years as well. Um, so that's a big part of our work is looking for permanency as well with extended family. Um, if that isn't going to happen and that can't happen uh, for lots of different reasons, um, then the connection to the family uh, is really important and just as important. And then if looking into adoption, um, we always explore Indigenous families first, of course. That's a priority. Uh, that's the number one priority. If a child or youth can't be with their own family, then, uh, then it's looking to an Indigenous family as well to provide permanency or uh, not just necessarily adoption, but transfer of custody, which is a little bit different than adoption. Um, some nations where a child is a member and carries their membership through um, don't necessarily uh, look at what at Western adoption will say as something that's uh, that's adhered to as far as agreeing to that for many many reasons um, depending on the nation there are there are many traditions and reasons for that so so definitely looking at permanency for, for that child or youth so that they don't remain in care as well. Um, when we talk about uh, cultural connections for children and youth, the importance of it, um, I could share probably a few hundred stories of the importance of why culture saves lives um, for any child or youth or any adult who's been uh, disconnected from their culture. Um, when I think of one youth specifically that I worked with uh, many, quite a few years ago now. So the role that I'm in, I've been in um, going on 11 years now. So I met uh, this young person, uh, I guess about nine years ago, uh, with their siblings as well, and um, started going into the home to make a connection and did some cultural planning, took some cultural materials and started to try to build a relationship uh, with them. My first couple of visits uh, with them, they uh, told me they were Filipino. They thought they were Filipino. Right? So these children, uh, the one that I had worked with specifically at the time, she went into care. She was three, three years old, roughly. Uh, the other two were six and nine, I think. So my first uh, meeting with them all, I think they were maybe six and 11 and 14 or 12 or something. And so they thought they were Filipino. Um, which I found interesting um, because they actually were Inuit. 
Um, so they were Inuit. Um, their, one of their parents was Inuit and one of their parents was Scottish. And their Inuit family from, uh, of course, eastern areas of this country, um, they came from a family full of very famous carvers, very famous artists, um, world-renowned carvers, soapstone carvers, wood carvers. And these siblings, they felt they were Filipino because they'd never had conversations about their ancestry and about their indigenous identity and their family um, connections and their family history. So we started really working with them to share experiences of that side of their family and who they were and uh, started really connecting uh, with their community, which was hard to do, of course, because, you know, the territory time difference, uh, really difficult having phone calls with one of the extended family um, because they were so remote that every time we called, the phone would disconnect or, but we still tried, we still did it every week. We scheduled calls and set up calls where they could start making a connection. Um, and this one young, uh, sibling that I worked with specifically for quite a while was an amazing artist, just amazing. The skill and the gifts and talent was beyond uh, for someone of, of their age, was incredible. And so inherently, innately, that was in this young person already. And it hasn't, it hadn't been ignited because they had no idea of those conversations about their family and their ancestry and who they were and who their people were and where they came from. And once that started happening, it just grew. It's like a fire that's there and it just has to be lit. And those opportunities allowed for people, for young people to experience that and to not feel that shame of who they are and where they come from, right? Because our communities are so full of love and caring and laughter and strength and resiliency, gifts, talent, and that really had to be ignited um, because they didn't know about it, because it wasn't discussed, right? So those conversations really started uh, that young person to bloom. Um, and, you know, they did quite well for quite a few years until they got a little bit older when they were still in care. And unfortunately, uh, they ended up passing away two weeks after they turned 19 and aged out of care. So it was very tragic, very tragic. Um, but the opportunities, you know, that became once they realized uh, where, their, where they were from, where their family was from, where the, who their people were, and that sense of pride in their family as well and not carrying that sense of shame where they couldn't talk about it. And so that importance of culture and that importance of connection uh, is, is there and it's so important. Um, and it really, really is about building relationships and open dialogue and really talking, uh, talking about that it's okay, you know, to feel confused. It's okay to maybe not want to explore that because of your hurt or your pain that you're going through. And one day you might want to explore that, right? But children and youth deserve to have that put in front of them. And if they choose to pick it up, then they pick it up. But if they don't, at least it's been, it's been there, it's been discussed, it's been talked about so that there isn't that shame uh, that a lot of our people carry because that's what we've been taught, you know, through generations, not to talk about who we are, where we come from, who our people are. So that's, uh, that's another part of our role is really having those uh, relationship building opportunities for children and youth to, to talk about and explore who they are and try and uh, have them look at their gifts and open that up and, and kind of uh, excel with that uh, so that they can discover more and want to discover more who they are. Um, and lots of opportunities that we try and provide to have you know children and youth be part of discovering that. Um, a lot of times, you don't uh, having them just come in and talk and just sit uh, and do artwork could have that experience of looking at uh, different different things from their own communities, um, discovering you know who artists are from their communities, right, and the history of their nation, the history of their territory, and then you know they want to know more, and those conversations grow and grow, and then before you know it, they're trying to explore it and learn it on their own, 
right? We also do a lot of um, homecomings where we take children home to their territory so that they can meet uh, community and family. And a lot of times there's something that goes on in the community that communities will put on, whether it's a naming ceremony or they'll do a big honoring feast or a welcome feast. And uh, that's another great opportunity that we get to have and see children make that connection as well. And youth too. My daughter's tapping her watch. <laughs> Am I done? <laughs> <laughs> Does anyone have any questions or I could stand for hours telling you about this but <laughs> go ahead. What's support? Yeah, so a lot of things over the past couple of years of course have improved, thank goodness, for uh youth that turn 19 and become young adults um in that transitioning which is, you know, extremely, uh, extremely important. And of course, you know, uh, unfortunately, there's been a lot of failures um, for youth that have turned 19. And if they've been in care, you know, their whole life. And if there hasn't been any family connections or community connections, um, you're turning 19 and you've, who have you got? You've got no one, right? Um, and so when you think about our own children, you know, our children still have us when they turn 19. Our children still have us when they're 30, right? When they're 40, when they're 50. So, so the reality, the importance of having that family connection and the importance of us in our roles, making sure that they have someone in their family that they can identify, that can be part of that connection. It's okay not to be able to care for them because not everybody can, but it's a, it's better to have that connection too, right? At least there's a family member and many, and most of the time there is, um, you know, there is someone who has been connected, who's been uh, part of planning, who's been attending meetings. Um, we have what's called a youth transition worker that works with us in our offices um, over the past two years. And so she works with youth um, that are between the age of 13 and 19. And part of her role is really, really connecting the youth to community supports as well. So making sure there's things in place for them before they turn 19. And also life skills. Um, you know, a lot of youth don't have the opportunities to even know how to open a bank account because no one has shown them, right? How to, how to go and open a bank account, how to apply for ID, things that, you know, normally we as parents would, would teach children. A lot of youth in care haven't had that opportunity to learn those things. So the youth transition worker really helps support with the life skills, grocery shopping, how to, how to properly, you know, budget, buy food. Um, and then of course, youth workers get involved too. Um, the social worker will have a youth worker assigned to that youth and kind of help them get those pieces in place. But for youth now transitioning, I, I forget what the amount is, but um, the provincial government just put in uh, funding for youth um, transitioning out of care at 19 up until I think age 24 now. And I for, it was millions um, that was just funded over the past probably six months. Um, so amazing and, and much needed, right? Um, and also there's also, um, there is a, uh, living kind of uh, agreement that youth can go under from the age of 19 to 24 and it's called AYA. Um, I'm not an expert on it because I don't work in that part of the ministry but it's for youth who are attending school, college or university um, and living independently or living semi-independently and they will cover their costs and living expenses up to age 24 now. So that was increased in the past two years that's gone up as well. So there are some things, quite a few things now that have been in put in place, which was so needed, right? So needed, especially again, living here in one of the most expensive places, right? Um, so yeah, thankfully the, the province and the federal government uh, put quite a, quite a chunk uh, towards that now. So that's good, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so I'd Thank like you. to introduce you to um, Elder Maria Reed. And uh, I will let her introduce herself. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Matt. Chi miigwech. In my language, 
That is thank you very much. And that is Ojibwe. Bonjour, I mean, Wabigekek Ikwe, Indichnikaz, Indichnikaz Maria Reed. Hello, welcome. My spirit name is White Hawk Woman. My English name is Maria Reed. And I am both honored and humbled to be sitting, standing amongst all of you wonderful people this evening. Now, the first thing I would like to ask you before I start us off with good words is, can we form all of our chairs into a circle? Because in my teachings, Nobody is in front of anyone else. Nobody is ahead of anyone else. We are beside each other. We walk beside each other. And when we are together, we sit in a circle. So nobody is discluded and nobody's back is to anyone else. So I would like us to do that, please. And when we are all in the long house or the big house as we call it, we use our long house voice. And this is my long house voice. In my culture, which is Ojibwe on my father's side, and I would like to ask my father Bud Reed to stand up. <laughs> This is, this is where my indigenous heritage comes from, and it is Ojibwe and French from the Botswana Band in the Garden River Territory in Ontario. And on my mother's side, and would my mother stand up please, this is my mother Irene. And my beautiful parents are 90 years young and 87 years young. Yes, yes. Both my grandparents on my mother's side are from a small town in Sweden where our cousins, the Sami, live. And the Sami are the indigenous folks of Sweden. And I just recently have watched a movie called Sami Blood, S-A-M-I, Blood, and it's on Netflix. And I found out that the Sami people of Sweden were colonized by the Swedish people, sorry, mom, <laughs> and forced to go to school, to residential school, and speak Swedish and act like a proper Swede instead of their native language, which was Sami, and they are and were reindeer herders. So I found it very interesting that the same thing happened with them as what happened to our folks here in Canada being colonialized. Now you'll find that I go off on a tangent now and again and I'm allowed to do that because I'm an elder <laughs> and elders tend to do that and elders are long-winded but I would like to digress back to the beginning and start us with good words. I never use the word prayer because prayer is very triggering to a lot of indigenous folks. They look at it like it's religious and our indigenous culture is not a religion. It's a way of life. It's the way of living in a good way, equal to everything on Mother Earth. So this is how I start with everything I do with good words. And I'm not going to ask you to join hands, but we are sitting in a circle. So we have wonderful energy connecting each other right now. Creator of all good things, grandmothers, grandfathers, seven sacred directions, and all of our ancestors. I invite the ancestors to join us today to help guide us 
to help see things in a good way from our hearts. So we can speak from our hearts and not always from our heads. I ask Creator that you watch out for all these beautiful people that I sit with today. Keep them healthy, keep them strong, keep them happy, and most of all, keep them very well loved. As well as all the two-leggeds, the four-leggeds, the ones that fly, the ones that swim, and even the ones that crawl. For we are all on Mother Earth together as one, one no more important than another. I'd like to give special thanks to our green friends, the tall silent ones that provide us with oxygen to breathe, clothing, and shelter. And for the smaller green friends that provide us with food and medicine and the water that gives us life. Creator, I ask that you wrap your love around all of the children that didn't come home from school and all of the men and women that have gone missing and send us all the strength, the courage, the wisdom and the love to listen to and take good care of the ones we have here and now. For some of them will be the strong voices of tomorrow. I would like to thank and acknowledge our Coast Salish people whose unceded territory we live, laugh, love and work on. And Creator, I ask that you watch out for all the folks that are sad, that are sick, that are hurting, that are grieving or that are going down the black road and help them to find their way back to the good red road. For this is where our spirits are the most joyful and this is where we're born, on the Red Road. And with that, Creator, I thank you for this day. And I thank you for this opportunity I have with these wonderful people. All my relations, Chimi Glitch. Mm. Mm. And that's how I like to start whatever I do. I work as an elder with the Ministry of Children and Families, Circle 5. And this is my sister from Circle 6. No, not Circle 6, Spirit of Children. No, I work for the Ministry, yeah. Circle 3 and Circle 6. Ah, okay. Yeah. North okay. Fraser, I don't know what they call it. Okay. I call it North Fraser. And I'm Circle 5 in Surrey, <laughs> yes as well as the Fraser Valley Aboriginal youth and children, or youth, families and youth in care, Yothmis. And that's what we call, we call it, Yothmis. And I work with youth, I work with families, I work with everyone. I also do some work with the Federation of Youth in Care, the Law Society of BC, the Medical Society of BC, Fraser River Indigenous Society, Métis Family Services, and there's a few others. When I first became an elder, an older, much wiser elder told me that once you're an elder, now that you're an elder, you have a great responsibility to teach people, to share your wisdom, to share your culture, and to share good words with all that you meet. And the way I look at it is if there's a few things that I share with all of you this evening that resonate with you, I'm hoping it may be like a stone in a pond and create the ripple effect. Because you may go home and tomorrow you may say to a friend, a relative, you know what I learned last night? I learned that this and this and this. And hopefully that will gather momentum. And <clears throat> that is the way our culture works. We are storytellers. We, we learn from words handed down from our elders, from our parents. And 
I would like to share with you a piece of my story. I didn't grow up in my culture. I didn't know. And then when I was in my 20s, one of my aunties said to the whole family, she said, I just did a family tree because this is before <coughs> Ancestry DNA and, and Ancestry.com. I just did a family tree and you all know that we're indigenous. And the family was in an uproar. What? We're indigenous. What do you mean we're indigenous? And she said, yeah, Granny was from the Botswana band on the Garden River Reserve. And we are all, oh my goodness. Well, my aunties, they, they had a bit of a fit because some of the aunties said, oh yeah. And the other aunties said, well, I don't know. They may be indigenous, but I'm not. And they were all sisters. But back in the day, nobody admitted that they were indigenous because your children got taken to residential school and you were shunned and it was bad. And I said to my dad, I said, dad, didn't granny ever talk about it or didn't any? Dad said, no, we didn't talk about stuff like that. And I said, whoa, okay. But, and then I found out that my Granny has had a plot of land on the Botswana Reserve, but because she married a Métis fellow who was my great-grandpa, he was Chippewa and French, she lost all rights to her piece of land. Because if women married outside of the band, they lost their rights to everything in the band. And so I have all kinds of information and, and her band number and her, her number because back then we were all numbered. We were numbers. We weren't names, we were numbers. But she, they moved out here because they didn't want their kids taken away and put in residential school. So it was, it was very interesting. And then they, they settled in Millardville, and I don't know if any of you know Millardville, it's a small area in Coquitlam where a lot of the Métis and French people lived and still do live. And when dad went to school, he was taking French in school, so he'd come home with his French homework and he'd ask his mom and his dad and some of the aunties and uncles to help him with his French homework. Oh, well, they helped him with his French homework and he was happy and he went back to school and handed it in and it was all wrong because they spoke Michef, which is a Métis language. It's kind of a mixture between French and Anishinaabe, which could be a little bit of Cree, it could be a little bit of Ojibwe, but it was a mixture of the two. So that's why he got all his French homework wrong. He says, that's it, I'm never asking any of you again to help me with my <laughs> French homework. <laughs> but uh, so, it made sense to me then because when I was young, I had this reoccurring dream that there were wild Indians chasing me and they had a full headdress and they were on horses and they were chasing me. And I'd wake up before they caught me, but this was a reoccurring dream. And when I found out that I was part indigenous, I thought, oh my goodness, I wonder if that symbol symbolizes, I wonder if that was, maybe that was the ancestors trying to tell me something. Because we believe that the ancestors 
are always here. And right now, some of the ancestors are here as well. And because none of you know me, I introduced myself. But when we have a circle, even when we know each other, we always introduce ourselves because we never know which one of the ancestors are joining us and they like to know who we are. And when we introduce ourselves, we always speak about our roots. And we, that's why I said on my dad's side, I am Ojibwe and French and Chippewa and on my mother's side. And sometimes you say the names and you always talk about your, your lineage because it's a respect. So that, that's a little piece of my story. Uh, I would really like because I believe that we all have a very special heritage that, that lives within us that is important. It's our roots. So if we could go quickly around the room and introduce yourself and just say what your roots are. In, in our culture, we have what's called the medicine wheel. And the medicine wheel is made up of four colors, black, white, yellow, and red. And that signifies all the people of the world. So in our culture, we all work together. We all work together as people. And also our families lived together, sometimes two to 20 families in the, in the big house. And there were many moms and there were many dads and there were many aunties and uncles. And if mom was out doing chores, you always had an auntie that was a mom. And there's a reason that we all call each other cousins because really at the end of the day, we kind of are all cousins deep down yes uh, what else can I tell you I'd like to open the floor to some questions because I had some things that I was going to talk about but I would rather take my lead from all of you because you've come here to learn and I may not be speaking about what you want to learn. So who would like open the floor to questions? Uh, if you do want to have a really good experience with drumming and singing and, and as you said, culture saves lives, there is a, um, a small center down at Juan Hastings, on you know, Sky Train Trip, and that is where you will genuinely be with People that are still really in, in, in practicing the culture, it's alive. That's so the Vancouver Aboriginal Friendship Center. Not, not the Aboriginal Friendship no. Center. That's great, too. That right now is being used as housing because there's been a lot of fires. It's temporary housing right now, so not as much activity at the Friendship Center. But do, do check that out, too, when it's up in Dakota. That's uh, on Hastings as well, but at Victoria. So one Hastings, you have to get to Chinatown. Sky train and then just head on down to Corral and, and Hastings, and it's been there for a long time now. And you'll hear the drums, you think you'll see elders there. That's great, that's yeah. great. And it's now at I know I've been asked a question before regarding powwows, and people have asked me. Uh, I'm not indigenous. Is it okay if I go to a powwow? Yes, powwows are open to everyone. And we love to have guests and visitors that have never been 
to experience and to educate themselves and to know. Because in my eyes, the way we will cut out racism is to understand each other at a better level and to form the relationships and to experience the different ceremonies. Uh, I'd like to speak a little bit regarding our four sacred medicines. In the Indigenous culture, we have different teachings. Every area has a, a little bit of a different teaching on certain things. There are some things that are across the board foundation. And the four sacred medicines are across the board. The first one is tobacco. Tobacco is the most sacred medicine. And it is said to be sent down from Creator for the two leggeds for when they needed to put their wishes out to Creator, they would use tobacco and they would sometimes burn it and the smoke would take their their wishes and their good words to Creator, or it would be used to give thanks. Now, if any one of you came up to me and you said, Maria, I'm wondering if you would like to start this workshop I'm doing with some good words. You would offer me some tobacco as a thank you or as a token of your appreciation. And you would say, I'm offering you this tobacco. Would you open my workshop up in a good way? And it's up to the elder to say, yes, I accept, or no, I don't. Depending on if the elder feels it is something that they can do with a good heart. And that's the biggest thing in our culture, doing things with a good heart and from your heart. And it's difficult these days sometimes because quite often we're up in our head all the time. And to bring ourselves back to the, the heart is sometimes we have to stop. The second medicine is sage. And sage grows here in BC, up in Merritt and up in uh, Kamloops, Kelowna, in the dry areas. And there's many different kinds of sage. It grows on the prairies and in the States, quite a lot of different places. But sage is used to get rid of negativity. They even did a scientific study on sage. And they took a room like this. And they, they burnt sage. And they smudged it. And this is what we call smudging. When we burn the medicines and the smoke is cleansing. So they, they cleansed the room. They then took the airborne bacteria count before they cleansed it and after they cleansed it, and it was 94.3% bacteria free. After they cleansed it with sage smoke. So they closed the room up for a month, went back to the room after a month, took the bacteria count again, and it was still 93.4% bacteria free. So in our culture, if we feel that there's, there's some negative energy, we feel that we're, we're, we're sick, or we've had a really hard day and we're feeling stressed out, quite often we will smudge with sage. And we use an abalone shell and we put sage in and we burn it and just sweep the smoke over ourselves. And it is very grounding and very cleansing. When, when our folks were sick back in the day and even now, 
We will smudge them with sage. We will smudge the sick room. We will smudge the whole house. I have people come and ask me, we've just moved into this home and I don't know what it is, but I don't know, there seems to be bad energy here or something. It's just, it's, it's unsettling. So we'll smudge the home and they will feel better after that. Now, uh, whether you believe that or not, I have, a, I have a story. I worked at a place called Sophie's Place, and I don't know if any of you are familiar with that. It is where abused children go to speak to the police, to, to speak to counselors, to get the help that they need. It's in Surrey. So the folks that work there, they, it's a really tough job they have. It's, it's hard. And they asked if an elder could come and sit in one of their meetings. So I came to their meeting and there was about 12 of them and none of them indigenous. And I gave them a teaching on the medicines and on smudging. And I smudged all of them. I said good words. I explained what it was all about. And after this all took maybe 40 minutes, and afterwards I had five of them come up to me and say, I don't know what it is. I don't know if it's the smudging, whether it's the, the words, whether it's the, I, I'm not sure. But when you came into the room, my stress level was at a 10. It's only 40 minutes later and my stress level's at a two. I don't really understand it, but thank you. So, I don't know if it's completely the smudging, the, the whole ceremony of it, the words, or all of the things. Now, I know in Correct me if I'm wrong. The Chinese culture, it's the Chinese tea ceremony? Japanese. Japanese? I think there's both. There's both. Uh, Japanese are ritualistic though? Formal? Is that the one you have in mind? Yeah. One where it's more formalized? Yeah. And there's a whole... Right. That's Japanese? Yeah. But I know that they both do, do they? but there is... There's a reason that they do the whole ceremony. And somehow, the tea tastes better. It just does. So, there is definitely a place for ceremony and for culture. And not only indigenous culture, for all cultures. And I'm sure we all have our different cultural practices. And it's, it's very, very important. And with the kids, as we heard, yes. Sorry, sorry, I don't want to interrupt you. It's okay. Um, kind of when you're talking about cultural practices, one thing I always wonder is, um, like, would it be cultural appropriation if, say, like, myself as a settler, if I were to take up some of those different, like, cultural practices, whether from Indigenous culture or from other cultures that I might not come from, but it's, you know, it's one of those things that if I were to take up smudging, is that cultural appropriation, or what is that? That is outstanding. The only thing that you want to do is with any ceremony or cultural practice, you want to learn from someone that is cultural, that does it in the right way. The authentic way. The, yes. Mind you, different places have a little bit of a different teaching. But when you do things from the heart, with a good heart, you're good. With a sincere good heart, then you are good.
Yes. I just want to add something to that, that we all have different protocols and teachings that go with our medicines because every indigenous tribe is unique and specific. So we all come from a different way. We're not all the same. But you have to remember what some of our ancestors went through to use their medicines, to pick that medicine. My ancestors lost their life. They were killed for harvesting medicines, right? To go to their sun dances, to go to their ceremonies. So we have to be mindful of that. There's protocols we have when using medicines, when harvesting medicines that are important, right? And so it's to learn that, right? But I always encourage people to learn from your own culture. What's important in your own culture to your people? What medicines come from your territories for your people? And learn that.